Done. Great. Thank you. Um, yep, it's uh, showing that it started now. So uh, welcome to Nottinghamshire Healthcare's Council of Governors meeting. Um, it's uh, and wel welcome to all our governors, including a number of governors who are new to the council. You're particularly welcome. Uh, and uh, also uh, one or two have been re-elected as well. So congratulations to all of you. Um, given that there's so many people on the call, I'm not going to try and go around and get everybody to introduce themselves. But if I could ask you when you do speak, if you could just uh, tell us who you are and your role in relation to um, the, the council and or the trust, please. Um, so in terms of apologies for absence, um, Lucy, I know that you'll uh, make sure a record of absences uh, gets put into uh, the minutes appropriately. Uh, I did just want to mention uh, one from the board, Umar Zaman, uh, one of our non-executive directors, uh, I'm afraid is still unwell, so isn't going to be with us again uh, uh, today. Um, I'm hoping that he'll be uh, back in the saddle again soon, though, and I'm sure that we all continue to send Umar our best wishes uh, on, on his recovery. Um, so if we could go to our declarations of interest and just to ask if anybody has got any interests that they need to declare in relation to today's agenda please if you could indicate in the chat bar anybody if you do have any declarations of interest okay i'm not picking any up thank you um in which case uh, if we can then um, go to the minutes of our previous meeting, which was back in January, which feels like a long, long time ago, um, but uh, it, it's, it's a little mixed. It feels like a long time ago and yet feels like the time has flown by very quickly. So could I please ask governors for an indication of, uh, first of all, if uh, you agree these as an accurate set of minutes, an accurate recording of that meeting. If you could give an indication in the chat bar with a Y or an N, please, I'd appreciate that. Thank you. And I think that will have us covered. And uh, in which case, if we could go uh, in terms of the action log for matters arising that fell out of the last meeting, um, there was one there um, about the um, uh, Better Mental Health for Bassett Law uh, consultation. Um, and there's an update there from Lucy that that is uh, currently being processed because the, the actual consultation only closed a couple of days ago. Can I just see if anybody got any other matters arising from the last meeting which aren't covered off on our, our agenda today? I suspect there's quite a lot that rolls over, to be honest. Um, and again, I'm not getting any indication there. So if we could go to item 23 then, um, our lead governor's report. And Jim, if I could hand over to you, please. Jim. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you, Paul. And um, Jim Aliander, lead governor, uh, pub a public governor living living near Mansfield, for those of you who are new, new to the meeting. Um, I'll assume that colleagues have had the opportunity to read the report. Um, just picking out some what you might call highlights. I use the term normal governance, the, the wish for us to resume as soon as we can um, our engagement with, with our services, which uh, we fully understand has been held up by the natural requirement to respond to the pandemic. But with uh, board members now engaged in, in virtual visits, we hope that we can uh, partner them perhaps or, or engage soon. I, I picked that point up uh, early in the report. Um, I refer to the last of our informal meetings and again for new governors between um, council meetings and Paul commented on how long ago it seems since the, the January one and we're not due one till July, uh, that once a month or so informal open house sessions are held um, a kind of virtual coffee break 
Uh, we had one yesterday, in fact, prior, prior to this meeting, without an agenda, just the opportunity to say hello, get something off your chest, um, share a few thoughts about what you think might be priorities uh, for the Trust at this time from a governance point of view. Uh, and I feed those uh, through to Lucy um, and we, we discuss where they might go next. Usually the next place they go is the steering group, which is also held uh, between meetings. Um, we were fortunate at the beginning of May because Paul and John Bruin were able to, to contribute to that session. And I make a note in my report as to some of the areas we covered. I think the white, of, of those areas, the, the white paper and the, the ICS um, are likely to be those that, that have the longest legs uh, go, going forward. Um, picking out um, a couple of other issues then, uh, we had the, the recent uh, focus CQC on the Seacoal Ward. Now that is picked up in a couple of other reports later on. I know John wants to make reference to it, so I won't linger on that. Uh, but uh, for governors who have not seen it, I would recommend you, you have a look at the report itself, which is available and, and published. Um, and the other thing which is an innovation, um, and I'd like to thank Shirley for this, Paul, if I may, uh, is the connection with Sherwood Forest uh, Foundation and Trust, um, which uh, Shirley helped to, to broker. Sue Holmes, the lead governor there, and I had a chat probably six weeks ago now, an introductory chat and early in April they were kind enough to invite me to their membership and engagement group, um, a particular group meeting they have, uh, and to allow me to stay for the whole meeting. So I got a kind of rounded experience of the agenda there and it's probably fair to say, although Shirley won't have minuted it the way I'm going to say it, that governors were champing at the bit to get back engaged with uh, <clears throat> Kingsmill Hospital and the other services that, that Sherwood Forest um, provide. Um, the opportunity arose for us to consider whether we might come up with some kind of joint project work as governors going forward. I've not been able to take that anywhere yet except to today's board uh, and just say that if governors have ideas for activities that relate to our duties is the way that I would put it, that we might be able to, to share going forward then that would be helpful too. I see Shirley's hand is raised. I don't know whether that's a question relevant to what I've just said, Shirley. I'm pretty uh, no, sure it, it was about the visits. Yeah, we'll come. Visits. OK, well, shall I just run through and complete the report? Nearly there, Shirley. Yeah. Uh, and then we, we can pick it up subsequently. Um, yeah, yeah the, the report concludes with um, comments about training and development sessions. Uh, new governors had the opportunity to join those uh, mm. during March. Mm. Um, and I flag the fact that in July, uh, the Governor Focus Conference is on, on the 6th, 7th and 8th. Lucy has sent an invitation out to governors who might be interested in attending uh, all or part of the Governor Focus Conference in July. Uh, and we will continue with the opportunity to flag um, joint, joint sessions uh, wherever we can. And that's it from me, Paul. Great, thanks very much, Jim. Um, you, you snuck an acronym in there with ICS, which is the Integrated yes, Care System, colleagues, uh, which is our Nottingham and Nottinghamshire Integrated oh. Care System, where we work with other organisations. Um, Shirley, do you want to come in on the um, uh, on the point that Jim was making about um, governor governor connections back into visits? Yeah, yeah, I know everybody's uh, keen to do that. Um, Becky and I have had a conversation earlier this week to say we're in the process of developing a schedule with Grace. So we'll do the schedule, get the services, get NEDs and dates in and then bring that to governors if that's OK. It's doubtful there'll be any clinical areas for any time in the foreseeable future, but um, we've got lots of other areas that I'm sure you'll be interested in. Um, so, yeah, so we're progressing that. So give us a couple more weeks and then we should have a schedule out to you. Thank you. Great. Th thank you. And I know I know colleagues, Governor colleagues will um, you, you've, you've been very tolerant with us about saying we will get to it, we will get to it, but then here, here we are starting to put a proper time frame on it, um, which I hope is helpful for you to, to hear. So let, let me open it up and see if anybody's got any comments on um, what uh, Jim has said or indeed on the rest of his, um, uh, his paper. Uh, Malcolm, let's invite you in first. Malcolm. 
Thanks, Chair. I'm I'm Malcolm Street. I'm a clinical support governor based at Bassett Law Hospital. I work for the, uh, I was just going to say the out of hours service, but we're now the urgent care service. Um, just, just to, um, I, I just wanted to comment and say, uh, can't wait actually to go out and, and visit places and just get to know staff. Uh, we had a staff meeting the other week and uh, Alison Road Curie came virtually to the meeting and it were great for the rest of our team to see someone other than us. And, and it was quite a good meeting. So we, we're quite, I'm quite looking forward to just going around and meeting other staff members. Yeah, ab absolutely, Malcolm. And I know that there are uh, other other governors who have missed doing those uh, visits. There are other governors and indeed non-executive directors um, who are still waiting to get in there and actually make a connection uh, with our teams and with our services. Um, so it's good good to hear that it was valuable from the other side as well. Thanks, Malcolm. Uh, anybody else got any comments in relation to Jim's? paper no in which case uh thank you for that jim um if we can move on to um item 24 which is uh my report uh having i've just i, I did also realize as jim started speaking uh having exhorted everybody to introduce themselves uh i then didn't introduce myself at all so uh, i must just say for everybody i'm paul devlin i'm the trust chair um hence presenting the chair's report um i will take it as read uh, just a couple of pieces uh, to, to highlight. Um, I know that the new governors, governors and indeed some uh, longer standing governors joined in on induction sessions, um, which I was really pleased to be able to uh, at least contribute a little to. Um, uh, and a, a couple of pieces, um, the uh, appraisals for the non-executive directors is on the agenda for a little later on. Um, and a couple of highlights, um, John and myself have um, met with our um, the, the leadership group for our BME network um, a couple of times actually in the period since the last governor meeting, which is a really important place for us to engage with that network uh, to really understand uh, some of the issues that uh, the trust is um, is getting on with in relation to race and indeed tackling racism. Uh, and uh, it's always a really useful space for us uh, and is an important one. And the other one that I wanted to highlight was a session um, that uh, Sue Elcock, uh, our now medical director, John and myself, had uh, with a group of young people, I think it was 13 children and young people who use our services. And it was a really, really, positive uh, 90 minute session where we were listening to their experiences but also they were uh, asking us some really great questions challenging us on some of their experiences but also coming up with uh, other ideas about ways to engage children and young people uh, and it was um, one of one of those sessions where uh, on a on a video call right at the end of the day and still being able to go away feeling really energized by it uh, so I just wanted to highlight that one. And as as Jim was saying to me just before we got going, I think you'll see I've been um, going to a lot of meetings as well in the midst of everything else uh, over this period. So that's uh, that, that's all I'll say for that paper. Um, I'm happy to take any comments or questions if anybody has got any. So I'll just pause for a moment there. Again, uh, Jim. Jim, do you just want to give a comment? Uh, yes, please. It's a question, really, uh, uh, Paul. Um, picking up the cafe session, which sounded like a really exciting opportunity to, to meet some children and young people, is that the kind of activity in the months ahead that you think governors might be able to join? I, I would have thought absolutely. I think it's um, us and and I know that in conversations I've had with with Shirley, um, there's I think there's lots more we can do to really bring out what I call the ambassadorial role of governors, where actually you're acting as a as a, a face of the trust, particularly with the public, but as well as those who use our services um, and um, being able to 
uh, have those conversations about what we do, but also uh, those conversations with people understanding what it feels like to be on the receiving end of services. Um, so the, uh, uh, absolutely, Jim, I think it does lend itself. Those sorts of sessions do lend themselves to us being able to um, bring in some governors as well. That one, in, it, uh, interestingly, I know that some of my non-exec colleagues were disappointed not to be able to get on it. The numbers were deliberately um, uh, kept so that the young people had a very clear majority in the room so sure. that we weren't intimidating them just by um, being a, a bunch of us. Um, so that was one which was very well controlled, I think, by the children and young people and the staff who were supporting them. Excellent, thank you. Okay, in I'm going to take us on to item 25, the Chief Executive's update. John, if I could pass across to you, please. Thanks, Paul. Uh, good evening, everybody. John Bruin, Chief Exec. Um, and with reference to um, that last item, um, the Chair's highlight of, of the evening was beating his chief executive in the quiz. Um, <laughs> I'm quite surprised that he hasn't mentioned that already, or indeed it isn't in his report. <laughs> uh, so, um, given that there's, there's, there's quite a bit in this report, that, um, although it's only like referenced at the beginning, January seems both a long time ago and only yesterday, this, an awful lot gone on and um, we have some new governors on the call. I'll, I'll, I'll pick out, I won't just take this as red, I'll pick out some specific bits because there's some quite meaty chunks just to um, draw your attention to and then obviously happy to um, take comments and questions at the end. So on the first page there's an update um, from the most recent Care Quality Commission visit um, so, um, governors will be aware that um, the CQC are still not um, back to their normal way of inspecting organisations, but have continued to do inspections based on concerns um, around safety specifically. Um, now, our uh, low secure service at Wells Road in Nottingham was the recipient of such a visit following a direct whistleblowing concern raised by a member of staff um, a month or two back. Um, this was a, a totally unannounced visit, so um, nobody was aware. Um, they were there for two and a bit days, predominantly over the weekend, um, and focused on Seacole Ward, where the um, concern was raised from. Um, they have subsequently um, had a conversation with us with some verbal feedback and they've also published um, their findings which has resulted in a re-rating of the service um, on two of the five domains. So they've re-rated the safe and the well-led domain as um, inadequate and given us a notice to respond to um, with regard to um, what our actions will be with regard to the finding. Now, whilst it's, um, it's extremely disappointing to receive um, this feedback, as ever, it's really important that um, we, see, we receive it in the spirit that it's been provided and this is an external um, numbers of pairs of eyes and ears talking to our staff, talking to our service users and, and coming to a, a conclusion about um, those particular domains I've mentioned. And therefore, it's really important that um, we respond in a positive um, way to address the issues that we've raised, that they've raised. I just wanted to um, just take um, a couple of sentences to to talk about um, what what closed cultures mean. So, this is a um, a particular area of concern that the CQC has nationally on um, wards or teams or organisations that have what they describe as a closed culture, and that's in essence exactly what it is. So, um, 
where this is whereby um, teams particularly can become quite siloed and they are uh, perhaps overly tight and they don't share they have a sort of sense of nothing to see here everything's okay we're fine to get on with it and they don't necessarily keep up to speed with um, either local trust or national developments in terms of cutting edge quality um, and there's evidence to suggest that as if these closed cultures become too closed off then there can be concerns with regard to patient safety in the longer term um, so as as the council would expect we've responded really robustly to this we've had some good open conversations with the team leaders and the team about um, these concerns and um, we started to look at for example why some of our our own reporting hadn't picked it up um, and we will of course respond within um, the right time scales with an action plan back to the CQC and um, we're confident that we can um, respond and reply to the to the concerns that they've raised um, we've also used it as um, a, a perhaps um, a useful flag to check out across the rest of the organization whether there are similar issues that we that we may have missed elsewhere um, and we're, we're currently undertaking that piece of work <coughs> excuse me to um to ascertain this so whilst um not a great place to be um as ever it's it's the quality of response that's really important um, and we'll make sure that um we keep both um, the council and the board updated on progress. Um, moving to um, the next page, I'd, there's not an awful lot to say about um, national um, NHS um, improvements and um, NHS England, that's NHS EI, um, in terms of what their priority focus is. Um, this this report is um, already sort of looking to my eyes a little bit out of date now whilst those priorities and focus remain um we just come up some of us just come off a, a regional call with um nhs improvement about what recovery means um and there is and there are some um priority areas that are predominantly um non-mental health so you'll you'll people will be aware um in the media of the the very real concerns about what are called elective weights so this these are people waiting for procedures in in acute trusts like queens and city sherwood forest um bassett law district general um uh, around so that's elective care um weights for cancer treatments and interventions some of the waiting lists for these procedures nationally have have gone through the roof um, and there are very real concerns about the capacity of the NHS more broadly to catch up. Um, and some of this, there are concerns that some of this backlog may take a number of years to get on top of. So it's a real priority focus for NHS EI to um, enable systems, because um, it's not just about acute services, to get back on the bike as, as soon as possible. Um, you'll be aware of the challenge of that, not least the fact that um, everybody across the health and social care system has been has been at well over 100% um, since you know, the start of the second wave, at least back in September, October time, and asking staff to, to step up further without that time for um, the wellbeing support services to kick in for um, recuperation to take place puts a real massive pressure into the system um, and that's um, yeah, one of the areas of very significant concern um, particularly amongst chief executives and, and senior teams how we can continue to support staff in such challenged environments. Um, I just wanted to say a little bit under local systems about um, the vaccination programme, not to go through it all in detail, but um, the council will be um, aware that we are um, the coordinating provider for the vaccination programme across the county. Um, after a, a slightly tricky start back in December, January, um, 
I think we were only getting told off two or three times a day at the last COG, and um, it's reduced significantly. But um, you'll see there, joking aside, that um, the the coverage for the most vulnerable groups uh, across the county um, is well into the 90s. Um, 90 percent um, and this puts um, us and the region um, it, it into a really strong position um, you'll note that um, the severe mental illness cohort is around 64 percent and maybe thinking well that's quite low compared to everybody else um, the the, re the reason for that is that it, it's it's one of the cohorts that's come online later in the program um, and it's also um, within the group of what's termed clinically vulnerable. So these are people that um, may um, have anxiety about um, accessing services, may have anxieties around um, having a vaccine. Um, so it's taken some time to enable that to happen in a, um, in a clinically effective and safe way. Um, but again, that, that figure is one or two percent above a national average. So overall, we're performing well um, for um, that cohort of patients. Um, there's probably not much more I wanted to say about the system other than um, I think Jim referenced earlier the, the white paper. Um, people maybe have heard of this being discussed from a national perspective. And there's very, very significant change to the way that the NHS and um, care is is sort of overseen um, and organised over the next year, 18 months, two years, um, in terms of what organisations are going to look like, how um, money is distributed, how um, um, services are held to account and who oversees this. One of the biggest changes is going to be the um, the demise of a clinical commissioning group, CCGs, um, they will no longer exist from April 2022 um, and that um, the, the traditional provider um, commissioner um, dichotomy, if you like, will, will end. Um, so there's, there's, a, there's a large amount of work to undertake during this financial year to describe how that will look for the future. Um, and then then finally, Paul just wanted to um, I'm not going to go into too many of these in any detail, just to start to emphasize um, getting back to business as usual. So for many months now, we've been talking about um, staff accessing lateral flow testing and um, getting vaccinated and um, doing the social distancing, keeping our patients safe. And um, now whilst that's still going on, um, at the bottom of page three onto page four, there's a business as usual, uh, a few bullet points about, OK, so what does that actually mean? Um, so for the financial year that we've just started, there's what's called a rollover of contracts for the first six months. Um, but mental health services and the disability autism service nationally have been asked to provide a, um, an annual plan as usual. Um, I mentioned the white paper and then there's other work in progress there, which um, it looks may look like a few bullet points on 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 paper. But for example, um, the progressing readiness for the Sherwood Oak site has been, um, you know, Julie Atfield and her teams have been doing a tremendous piece of work on being able to get that um, facility up and running by the end of the calendar year. Um, the work that we're doing um, with the city um, integrated um, provider um, is uh, around for the homeless and multiple disadvantaged populations is really important work and um, that, that will set us in good stead for um, for future years. And the final bullet point around um, the work of uh, impact, which is the provider collaborative that we're our organisation is the lead provider for. So this is a um, essentially a contract that we hold and we subcontract to eight other providers across the East Midlands to provide um, secure services for um, a, a, across the, the, the forensic um, world of, of mental health. Um, that, that's a huge um, achievement for us. We're sort of leading the pack nationally. 
but it doesn't come without um, risks and issues. So just a, a sense that there's an awful lot of, of stuff going on as well as, as we emerge from the pandemic. Um, and then just in the executive analysis, I, I've just sort of summarised that really, and um, I'll perhaps leave it there. And then I'm very happy to um, take a question and comment. Thank you. Great. Great. Thanks, Thanks, very, Thanks, Thanks a lot for that, John. John. Um, uh, first hand I'm seeing is Paddy, Paddy Tipping. Uh, so, John, uh, I'm Paddy Tipping. I'm the Police and Crime Commissioner, or I'm a partner governor. Uh, John, there was an awful lot in that, but could I just take you back to the first point that you made, which was around the whistleblowing event to the CQC. Uh, what I think I'd be interested to know is uh, why whoever blew the whistle didn't feel in a position to work this through the organisation. In a sense, you touched on it a bit when you said we've been talking to the uh, uh, the teams involved and uh, uh, we're making progress. Uh, so, so I think uh, kind of my question is a bit more general. You know, uh, are you confident that the atmosphere and the culture uh, within the uh, trust is sufficient that people can raise concerns and have them properly examined? Yeah, thank, thanks, Paddy. Hi, um, well, it's a really good question. Thank you. And I don't know whether um, Sue Wilcott might want to come in after I've um, uh, said my, sort of my thoughts on that. Sue's the um, executive director that oversees that um, the forensic division and our, um, for you very welcome, Sue, our new uh, executive medical director. Um, so I, I think bluntly, Paddy, in answer to your question, no. Um, I don't think we're yet in, in the right uh, position around um, creating an environment of more broadly speaking up where all staff feel able to um, to put their hand up and say, I'm worried about this, this is a concern. We've got pockets of, of, of really good practice and um, we know what some of the challenges are. We started to put um, things in place, particularly around the culture and values, particularly in reviewing our freedom to speak up function. Um, but um, I think we've still got some way to go before we've got that environment right. Um, we know what the issues are, we know where we need to get to, um, and we, we're continuing to develop it. To develop it. So, for example, I had a conversation with um, the chief exec and um, corporate director from St George's in London um, this week, who were recommended to me by um, the regional Freedom Speaker lead saying that they they had some similar issues two or three years ago um, and had um, caught the eye of regulators for the really strong progress they made and there may be some learning there. So we, we're, we're plugged into them um, or will be very soon to help inform further some of the things that we need to do. Uh, so I don't know whether that, um, there's more that you'd, you'd like to add. Um. We've talked, I mean, talking about our division in particular, we've talked about a steel roof. And so people know how to escalate to a certain level. And we're trying to do a lot of work as to how they get outside of their normal hierarchy, because it's a very hierarchical um, sort of service to provide forensic services. So that's one specific. And I guess John said that we're doing a piece. It's about what were the early warning signs. So we at the moment can't identify why we haven't picked this up. So there is a piece of work, as John said, to go back into why not? Was the data that we've not looked at um, because um, it, it was not flagging? This wasn't flagging as an area of concern, which in itself, as you say, is more worrying than the actual issues, because the actual issues that were raised can be put right. Um, the more worrying is, is why. So we are doing that. Thanks. Thanks both. Paddy, I don't know if you wanted to come back on what you've heard there. No, I'd just say that's very helpful and uh, taking advice from other trusts and learning from their experience clearly is the way to go. So I'm grateful to both of you. Thanks, Paddy. And um, just to just to flag that it is something we'll come back to when we um, get into the performance assurance piece, um, hearing from the non-executive directors. So I've got a few people with hands up. I'm going to go to Roshan first, please. Roshan. Thanks very much, John and, and Susan. Um, I, I was really reassured to hear about the uh, the um, consultation that you'll be having with the other trusts. But I was wondering whether you could tell us a bit more about the mechanism by which you're going to be assessing how well 
your new interventions are going to be working in relation to culture and how that feeds back to the, the, the Council of Governors. Hi, Roshan. Yeah, um, good to see you. Thanks. A really good question. Um, I, I think the, the, there's a number of ways of doing it. So, um, the, and off the top of my head, in no particular order, I think um, some of the, for me, one of the, the, the best ways to um, get a get a check and a heads up about how um, culture and values work is going is through national staff survey. Um, people might think, oh, you know, that's only once a year, um, which is a fair point. But some of the uh, improvements we've seen um, this year in the publication in March compared to some of the challenges we've had in recent years have been um, heartwarming, really. Um, and I think um, if you look at some of the measures around um, staff engagements, morale, and we've improved really significantly. So at a broad brush level, um, I think that's encouraging in that we're moving in the right direction. Um, and um, albeit it might only be second hand, you draw a conclusion, therefore, that um, with that cultural improvement, that people's confidence and ability to put their hand up would be supported better. Um, the the um, the development in the National Staff Survey this year is that um, we're also going to be doing um, what are called quarterly pulse checks. So rather than it being just annual, there'll be every three months now we'll do a quick buzz into the organisation and sort of make sure that things are continuing to to move in the right direction. I think the other um, obvious um, way into this is through um, the freedom to speak up. Um, activity itself and that there isn't really a clear answer to what's the right amount of freedom to speak up issues that you want to come across anyone's desk and um, so therefore for example um, low reporting trusts um, are seen as a bit of a concern high high reporting trusts equally are seen well that might be too many so what's the right level um, but I, I think where we are, um, if you look at um, the, the Freedom Speak Up Index, which is published we, in terms of our performance, it's seen a sort of mid to low table. Um, my view is that I, I'd like to see more coming through um, so that we can, so that, that essentially, uh, to me, that's a, that's a sign that people are starting to feel more confident. Um, you obviously then have to sort of take account of the content of what's coming. Um, but there, there'd, be, there'd be a couple of sort of initial thoughts um, on that, Roshan. Roshan, I don't know if you want to come back on that. Thank you very much. I, I, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, the, the, the staff survey, the annual staff survey might be one indicator. But I wondered whether, given the heterogeneity and the heterogeneity and, and also the the, the, how large our organisation is. We have seen pockets of really good practice in some areas, but not necessarily translated to other areas. So I was wondering whether there was anything that was more locally uh, being developed, delivered and assessed and whether that would be helpful also. I think, I think that's a really good challenge, Roshan, in terms of us learning from where we're doing it well. Um, and being able to understand how that is working well. And the other piece of triangulation, which is my, my approach to it, is the piece that we were talking about a little while ago about the visits for, from both non-executive directors and governors and their spaces where, you know, part of, part of what we welcome there is that um, staff may feel able to say something to a governor um, that actually they feel, for whatever reason, um, less comfortable saying um, through other mechanisms. So I think there's a, a, a number of them. Uh, I've still got I've, I've got three more people to bring in, and then we'll see if we um, uh, can perhaps perhaps move on a little. Uh, Dean, first of all, Dean, can I bring you in? Hi, um, uh, thank you, Paul. Um, uh, in case of not labouring this, but kind of bring us back, and uh, Roshan sort of picked up on it. Um, I think what's interesting about this, there's, there's a body of evidence and um, 
the sort of research and theory it goes back to 1960s around closed cultures um, uh, started off with Goffman um, uh, there's been various attempts um, acknowledging that trust has done some amazing pieces of work to bring around changes with a classical institution at Rampton um, and also that there are you know many many good practices I I kind of want to underscore, it, it strikes me as a bit strange that Wells Road is a stone's throw from your office, John. OK, now I, I had the pleasure of being involved with the post Fallon report at Rampton. And one of the issues and in going into there after that to put in place the action plan, one of the things they said is that they moved the management centre inside the walls. OK, and um, I think there has to be a question asked, is that how a closed culture gets created that is only a stone's throw from the headquarters. Um, uh, and, and I know you will look hard at, at it, but I do think um, that has to be underscored. Um, I think the point I made earlier about how you learn, you know, there's some work that you've done to turn around at Rampton um so you know uh, how how can that be progressed but um whether covid whether the situation that everyone's been involved with over the last year with a lockdown is got in the way but there has to be a serious question around how someone feels and i think paddy kicked this off how does someone walk outside the organization how do they hit a steel roof and have to walk or pick up the phone um uh uh, and that that suggests something about the daily practice. I think the national survey is good, the pulse checks, but it does not replace what is happening in the daily practice and interactions and behaviours between the team that manages Wells Road and the wider culture. You know, it's not an institution up on a hill. It's right next to you. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks for those challenges, Dean. Um, Sue, did you want to come back on that specific point? If it would be helpful to, I don't know if that Please. helps. Yeah, I yeah. think I think uh, I think you know, Dean's put out a, a, a good challenge there, um, but yeah. it'd be good to get a response. Thanks. I'll do it in reverse order, Dean. So the point that you raised at the end was very helpful. So what we've done is send managers um, and clinical staff that were involved in the turnaround work at Rampton into Wells Road and also into other services to share that learning, which has been really helpful and fed back well. We've also, I think, Anne Marie is not able to join us, but from a nurse director point of view, the quality first visits, the quality first team has been enhanced and we are absolutely pushing them into every single service. So as we have that our own internal view and challenge before it gets anywhere near the CQC or people feel that there isn't a team that they can talk to, um, so I think we're starting to get feedback from from the internal teams, which is really helpful about the, the culture. I think COVID hasn't particularly impacted managers being visible because that, that, that's very it's, that's very yeah it's helpful to hear those things yeah yeah. So I was just going to say COVID hasn't stopped the clinical managers being out and about. We deem that still to be necessary um, in various formats, but our clinical managers have absolutely been out. So I'll stop there. Thanks, thanks, Sue, um, and. I'm, I'm, I've got Malcolm, Shirley, and then Jim, if I could go in that order, please. Malcolm. Thank you. Uh, I think most of my comments have already been covered. Uh, just to say that in my team, um, we're all quite aware that we can say what we like to whoever. Uh, it's, it's never been a problem for us. Um, we have that culture within our team, so we can say it like it is without prejudice and things get get done but yeah everything thanks. has been covered thank you thanks for that malcolm um shirley did you want to come in please yeah i just wondered if from a trust wide viewpoint be useful for governors to have a bit of a development session with simbi freedom to speak up guardian i don't know if they've had that before but simbi's uh, relatively new in post and doing some excellent work and obviously part of that work is encouraging people and making people feel safe enough to raise concerns internally and before they get to be a real issue so um, i can add that to the development session if um, if people would like that 
I, I think that's a really good suggestion, Shirley. Um, Simbi has actually done um, a few different sessions, including things like the Connecting Knots events. Um, she's done session with the board in board development. Uh, and uh, I think if we can work that into some of the governor development pieces, it yeah. will both give you some more information about how we approach speaking up, but I think we'll also help you do some of that triangulating as well. So, Jim, can we come to you finally, and then yeah, I'd like yeah, to... Yeah, thank you. Yourself. It's a different point on John's report. Uh, John, the trust-wide section, um, you, you make the point about the demand and acuity in mental health services has been at its highest since the start of the pandemic in recent times. Now, I wonder, you don't have to say if there's any relationship between the pressures that are evident at Wells Road uh, in the sense that everything is being done across the trust. Um, but I pick out the, the point you've made there because um, your need or the collective need to respond to this surge in demand must be stressing or stretching the teams. I'm, I'm making that assumption and I welcome your view on whether that's correct or not. Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Jim. Um, I've got the very excellent um, Julie Atfield, who's on the call, who's the Executive Director of Mental Health and Disability Services. She may want to say something uh, a bit more detailed as she's very close to this. But um, one, I think one of the particular challenges for mental health and disability services is that they're sort of the front door in, really. Um, so they're the first services to um, get hit when um, demand and crises and acuity hits. Um, that, um, and I, I don't mean this in any way, in a critical way, but the forensic services sometimes are a bit further down the line. So whilst um, they've had their own challenges to, to meet during the pandemic, it's it's not so much front of the queue. Um, and um, J Julie will tell you that um, that that the sort of post January, February has been um, the, the, the most challenging time as a service, uh, as sort of communities have started to sort of begin to breathe a sigh of relief. Um, they've all headed for her team's door. <laughs> um, so in terms of staffing and in terms of managing some real challenges, it, it's been really hot. So um, I don't know, Julie, you want to sort of add something a bit more sort of detail to that? Yes, uh, thanks, John. It's fair to say that um, wherever we had um, a pause in if you like referral rates particularly when people weren't going to see their gps last year you know referral rates did drop in those first few months of wave one um that as that's absolutely corrected itself um towards december um and all re referral rates are generally back where they were um we are seeing increased ref referrals into crisis, um, into liaison services and into early intervention in psychosis um, probably since December. Um, but it's also worth saying that people are feeling to be um, more unwell, more acutely unwell, um, but also that people in services, uh, because we're having a mixed economy of face-to-face -face video and uh, phone contacts with people. We're needing to see them a lot more, particularly since December. So people are seeing people in the community or contacting them at least 30% more than they were before. So our our activity has, has grown um, quite considerably. Um, we're managing to keep waiting lists um, actually reducing uh, across some of the key areas, but it, it has been very challenging um, and access to beds has been quite difficult, particularly over the last two months. Um, so, yes, it's it's starting to write itself, but uh, it has been difficult. Thanks. Thanks for that detail, Julie. Um, yeah, thank Jim, you. yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, that, that, that's fine. I mean, I, I, my point was really whether the service is stretched in response and, and there's some evidence that it is, but Julie's saying, that it's managed it's a managed response i think yes. is that fair julie yeah yes yeah yeah thank you okay um dean can i just check that you've got a legacy hand up rather than a fresh point
I'm not sh yes, thank you. <laughs> Great. Um, so, well, thanks for that. Um, and 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 as John, do you want do you want to do a, do a wrap up? Given that it was your paper. Um, it, yes, thank you. I just wanted to um, apologise to Lorraine, who's um, on the call. I for, I forgot to introduce uh, the council to Lorraine. Lorraine Hooper is our um, new director of finance and digital estates facilities um, and has um, replaced um, Alison Wilde who was interim but Simon Crowther some of you may remember um, Lorraine is um, the new substantive appointment we were very pleased and very lucky to have her it's her first council of governors to um, tonight Lorraine started at the beginning of February so I was just thinking oh saw her face there I don't think she's been here before and not been introduced so I just wanted to say um, by the council, and um, you're very welcome. Thanks. Thanks, thanks, John. And I'll take that as a piece of poor chairing as well. Not inviting, not re recognising that Lorraine was in her first council meeting. I think it does actually reflect um, how quickly it feels like Lorraine's uh, managed to get herself really well embedded into the uh, board of directors. So let's move on then to item 26, the performance assurance report, which Stephen, you're going to introduce. And um, I, I think there'll be some interesting triangulation to some of the conversations we've had already. Stephen, if I can uh, invite you to uh, introduce yourself in the item, please. <coughs> okay. Um, Thank you, Chair. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Stephen Jackson. I'm Vice Chair of the Trust, um, a non-executive director, and 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 relevant uh, for what we're going to talk about in a few minutes. Uh, I also chair the audit committee. Um, so um, what I wanted to present um, was uh, a, a new report, and uh, um, I, I think I'll say something more about its newness and 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 what feedback we'd like in in a moment or two, but but I think Steve, it's, Stephen, could I just could I just make sure that governors realise that this is a paper that got sent out as one of the additional papers, um, just in case anybody was looking for that. Apologies, Stephen. Okay. Oh. With uh, with that in mind, Paul, and I, I might describe the paper a bit more a bit more fully, but um, um, I, I think it's a, a, an appropriate moment, particularly with with so many uh, new uh, governors on on the line um, this evening, that um, an important general duty uh, of of the of the Council of Governors is to hold uh, us non-execs um, to account. Um, uh, for the overall uh, performance of the trust, and and this new report is 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 aimed at uh, at helping governors uh, in 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 that task, um, and, and and also indeed it, it, it it's uh, it's meant to be helping the um, the non execs to to be able to um, to talk about the uh, the key areas um, in, in which. Um, you know they have been seeking um, uh, governance and assurance um, as as the um, as time has gone along. Um, I, I, this is only really the first time that this um, this report has been presented um, to to the council, and um, I, I I think um, it's not in a perfect form yet. I think it's in a pretty good. It's pretty good effort, but it's not in its perfect form yet. And I think as we work through subsequent meetings, we'll we'll see um, how we go, what sort of questions we get, and 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 we'll uh, adapt the report to make it as as useful and and helpful as we as we possibly can. And 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 with that in mind, um, you know, offline, I, I I would appreciate any feedback that um, that. Um, that, that any governors have got um, on the level of detail that's included and, and the sorts of things that are being being covered. It'd be, uh, be most helpful. Um, also shown in the paper is the, the governance structure of the board committees which report into the, the, the overall uh, trust board and there you've got a, a, a list of, uh, of members who attend uh, each meeting and and also um, a note of, uh, of of the chairs of, of each of those um, of, of, of those committees. Um, 
we've we've chosen today um, five themes because we thought we could just about manage five themes uh, within the in the context of the meeting, and and I think they were rather self-selecting because they were the uh, the things of the moment, um, the areas that that, that we have been, um, been 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 working with, and uh, and, and what what uh, um, I'd like to do now is to go briefly through each each of the, um, the, the, the the subjects, but I'm going to ask my uh, my colleagues who who chair the other committees uh, to lead um, uh, the, the the discussion on uh, on on each uh, on each topic. So I'm going to start with uh, in, in no particular order. I'm going to start with with finance. So um, if um, if if Trevor could uh, could just say a few words about finance, and then we'll we'll take any questions on that section, and then we'll move on uh, to the next one. Thank you, Stephen. Yeah, Trevor Orman, um, non-exec director and chair of finance and performance. Firstly, to correct it, I would welcome Lorraine to uh, <laughs> <laughs> to the team, um, and as as I think. Uh, Paul alluded, it feels like Lorraine's already been around a while, so she obviously knows her way around the financial arena, which is hugely helpful. So welcome, Lorraine. But I'd also, I think it's important to thank Alison Wilde, who was acting interim finance director, who did an outstanding job bridging the gap between um, Simon leaving and Lorraine joining us. So um, uh, we're really at full strength and, and I'm really delighted about that. In terms of the overall financial position, I think you'll find that every trust in their country is in a quite a precarious situation where we've had the impact of COVID. And this is a completely unplanned, unknown event that apart from crippling resources, um, obviously hits hard on your financials because of the magnitude of expenditure that, that we weren't planning for. In the first six months of um, our overall yearly plan, the funds were being that any any surplus or COVID impact was going to be covered by um, NHS, NHSE and I, so that we would we would hit the first six months at a break even position, which is which is exactly a logical, sensible thing for NHSE I to do, uh, because we, it was in a, a an unknown arena um, rather than pushing people into deficits. For the second six months of the year, um, the, the, the rules of the game have somewhat changed, where the, the, uh, the consolidated, integrated, uh, the ICS has, has, has determined that we have to reach a break-even position across the community of Nottinghamshire, which means that instead of uh, NHSE and I funding any gap, it's got to be funded by a group of trusts together. Now that's going to be extraordinarily difficult, not for our trust and the community of trusts, but also across any trust in the country. So we will end up um, in still very, very good shape our, ourselves. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want anyone to to think that we've got an overrun condition because we haven't. We'll have a minor deficit. We're not an outlier. Um, and one of the one of the areas that, that's worth noting as well is when you're in these situations, apart from managing your financials in a normal routine, you, you, you have the added burden of where we have to commit to improvement activity. And when you're when you're drowning with activity of just keeping uh, the, 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 the place uh, uh, safe and, and, and patients being dealt with, the opportunity to focus on financial and cost improvements becomes almost impossible. So we do know that there are areas that we can pick up going forward, but it's very difficult to, to put us in a recovery position. So we will end up the year a minor deficit. Um, it's still an extremely good position for the trust to be in, to be fair. And we still hold a good cash position as a trust that will give us a level of protection for any capital spend that we've committed to or going forward. So overall and in a nutshell, um, it's it, we've had a track record of, of, of hitting our targets. We'll slightly miss that. It's highly likely that we'll slightly miss that this year. It's not a big issue and we're not an outlier. 
um, and we will get ourselves back in shape when things settle down. But like, like all other trusts, we were caught out by changing the rules of the game, which somehow will have to be balanced out by NHSE and I over the coming weeks, which, which they have no alternative but to do. So um, overall, a good position. OK, um, so um, colleagues, any, any questions for, uh, for Trevor? I've, I've got a, a question Steve. from uh, Steve. I think you're muted, Steve. That's it. I have problems with my mute. Yeah. Hi, Trevor. Um, thank you very much for your report. Um, obviously, I sort of picked up that um, in the second half of the six months, the game did change and the money comes through the system as opposed to directly for the trust. Um, I gather this is the way things are going to go forward. Are we foreseeing future problems with this um, allocation and this mechanism or um, and indeed we have our system responsibility to think about within that which is going to offset our organizational responsibility i just wondered if there's any comments around that uh, it's, it's it's a really good question i can give you a personal view to be honest steve that is i can't see how nhse and i can recover from a situation of imposing um controls over trust after the event mm -hmm. so it, you can't you can't magic money um, you can't manage cost savings, so there will have to be a position where the, where the overall overriding bodies will have to come to a compromise. Um, the the amount of deficit caused by COVID is not, in my opinion, Steve, recoverable by cutting costs or improvements. It's just not feasible. And the last thing I'd want to, and I wouldn't support, a drastic cost cutting program that you know that causes you more problems for the future it is a major countrywide issue we should face up to it as a as a as a, a, a consortium of of trust across the country and make our position clear but we will have to contribute and do everything we can within the system as you can appreciate steve That's so that we can't be an outlier protesting against something where everybody else is in support so we will have to do our bit but i think we have to be very pragmatic in not putting our hand up for things that we know is not the deliverable. OK, that's great. Thank you very much, Trevor. You're welcome. Thanks, Steve. Steve. And uh, Lorraine, would would you like to uh, come in and add something? And uh, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll add my welcome to you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so if I if I may, in response to that question, I think so. I think Trevor's right. We're just in the we're just starting now to even try and contemplate what the size of the the COVID challenge has been getting to this point, and then what forgive perhaps a, is a crass phrase, but the clearing up will be so what the additional surge will be into our services, what physical health waiting lists will be. And so inevitably there is more uncertainty than I've ever known at any point in my career with finances. And that we're quite black and white accountants. Aren't we? We, like, we, we like some certainty. And so everything we've traditionally relied on has, has disappeared. And at the same time, there's the white paper that changes those commissioning arrangements and, and what might happen with CCGs as well. So there's certainly more uncertainty than I've known. But at the same time, what we have got are, are good systems and processes that are working through understanding what those problems are, both inside our organisation, then in our system, and how those feed in regionally as well. Um, the bit we don't know is what future mechanisms for financing look like. But our job is to make sure, as Trevor rightly says, we're a good system partner and we spend our money wisely in a value-based way to deliver care to our patients and that's our responsibility. OK, uh, thanks, Steve. Um, I, I've got, got a, no more. No more. There's a question. There's a question from Malcolm, um, okay. Stephen. Oh, it's not showing on my screen. Thank, thank you, Paul. Malcolm. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, I, I didn't know how to get the question back. Uh, everything's been covered, actually. Stephen answered the question, so there was no need to bother. Thank you. OK, thank you. Well, with 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 no more questions, then I'd I'd like to uh, change gears and uh, come to to my colleague Steve Banks to uh, talk about freedom to speak up. Okay, thank you, uh, Stephen. Hi, everybody. Uh, Steve Banks, non-exec. If uh, any of you haven't met me before, um, we kind of touched quite 
well on this subject earlier, so I'll just try and add things that haven't been said before and obviously leave space for some questions. Um, but I did want to, um, I think, start by saying it's many of the right questions were asked earlier. Um, obviously, we'd still rather somebody raise their concerns, albeit externally. Uh, and there's a number of routes you can do it. But we do want to create the environment where um, people feel safe and supported to talk about uh, issues locally. And that's usually the quickest way to fix things. Um, there's been a lot of uh, focus from the board I'd like to provide back to the governors uh, as by way of assurance um, on developing freedom to speak up. Um, we did have a gap during the year in having a guardian and we did notice, as the paper says, um, that uh, the actual numbers have decreased somewhat and, and that might have been part of the reason of people raising concerns. Um, but from a board angle, as well as having board development sessions on freedom to speak up uh, with, with Simbi supporting us, um, we've also completed a board assessment, uh, we've completed training, and some of us are um, going through a process with NHS IE, uh, where one of the specialists is helping us to review where we're at, um, help us with ideas and best practices from elsewhere, um, and see uh, what else we might need to be doing. Um, are we resourced correctly for sake of argument? Um, I draw attention to uh, the fact that um, there's training being rolled out for managers, which I do see as a key way of addressing some of the conversation earlier. Um, I've done the training. It's it's good. It raises some questions. Um, and at a board, we've discussed supporting managers locally to help make change, not just complete the training. Um, Paul and I both make ourselves available to, to Simbi regularly. Um, I meet her monthly, at the very least, on a regular basis. And we've um, introduced um, a bit more of the triangulation that Paul was talking about earlier. Um, so from my conversation with Simbi now, um, I talk with the rest of the non-execs in broad themes and in some of the areas of the trust where um, concerns are being raised um, to enable us to come to, to triangulate really with concerns that may be coming up through some of the subcommittees, particularly people or, or through quality. Um, so, so that also gives us uh, a bit more insight. We, we, we have been challenging uh, to some extent around Wells Road because um, I, I think the exec members were very, as always, to be honest, uh, open, transparent about um, what it is like there, um, which leads us to ask, well, why didn't we know more about that? And how do we find where the others are? Um, so if we've got a Wells Road to Dean's Point uh, under our noses, um, how can we make sure we're finding out to put more effort into other locations where needed? Um, so there's a, a reasonable amount going on uh, in that uh, in that situation. We're um, we're introducing or reintroducing a, a people subcommittee, um, as you can tell from the, the two papers enclosed today. Uh, so we did combine quality and people, um, but we will be reinstituting a, a people um, culture and inclusion uh, subcommittee. Um, where um, Simbi can also get further support and the, the Guardians can. So I just wanted to add those um, sources of uh, assurance and uh, provide some assurance to the governors that despite um, people feeling, some people feeling the need to go outside of the trust, there's no shortage of attention and uh, uh, effort and genuine uh, desire to make this a trust where people can talk freely and feel supported in, in raising issues that need to be sorted for, for patients or carers. So I'll stop there, Steve, and see if there's any questions. Any questions for Steve? Uh, Jim. Thank you, Steve. Um, it's more of a comment than a question, if I may, Steve. Um, and it's where we get assurance in this difficult area. And the comment I would make is, uh, and it's what you've been saying rather than necessarily written in the report, the fact you yourselves have been trained, uh, you ought to be able on that basis, I'm reading between the lines, as it were, to be able to question in the right way, in a contemporary way, in those difficult areas where without the expertise necessarily that goes with the training of the professionals, you as a, a director ought on the basis of your training 
to get beneath the skin, the skin of the issues. And I make that comment, I think, in particular uh, for um, to be helpful with new governors who would want to know how governors can uh, themselves gain assurance from the report that you're making. So it's a long winded way of saying thank you. But on the basis that I think I've learned something from that about the in-depth way you're addressing complex issues. Um, thank you, Jim. I appreciate you, you helping me make that clearer. Um, and um, I, I would say that that does help us um, ask the right questions. Um, it also prompts me to say that um, it also helps in um, not just supporting Simbi in her role, but also sometimes um, concerns are raised directly to us or to me. Um, and, and again, it helps us in the right kind of processes, if you like. But yeah, I'd recommend that. OK, Stephen, I'm not seeing anything else. I can't see any other other questions. Uh, got a, some applause there coming in, Steve, so uh, I think that's a first. Um, in which case, then um, I'll um, I'll take on the next section myself, which is the uh, the piece about the the board assurance framework, and this is the um, the method by which we um, uh, manage um, the, the 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 high risks um, that 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 are apparent to um, uh, to the trust. Um, and we, we've been on a, a little bit of a, a, a journey uh, for the uh, for, for, for the newer um, for the newer governors, in that we had a, a three-year review of our of, of, of our whole system and processes uh, in August uh, uh, 2020, and uh, there, there were a few recommendations that were made that we've we've um, we followed. Um, with 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 great enthusiasm, I think the old system had been a, a good one, but it, like like all systems, it, it, when you when you use them over a long period, they can become a little bit tired. And so so um, apart from improving what we were doing, there was also this this um, new life that I think that was that was bred into the uh, the process by by doing it so in the meantime we've we've re reviewed all of the strategic objectives that we had on the BAF and we've we've tried to to realign our actions and to and to reduce them so that, that our, our activities are, are much more focused um, we've reformatted um, uh, the, uh, the, the 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 BAF risks to show um, much clearer assurances and the way in which we're going to uh, be able to achieve and to reduce the risks in in of achieving our strategic objectives. Um, all of the individual risk registers uh, across the organisations which sit underneath uh, the BAF have 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 also been uh, reviewed and and re-energised and, uh, and, and 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 some eliminated altogether. And and overall, we've established a, a risk committee. Um, which um, which has been uh, chaired by the executive team, but which I, as chair of audit, yeah, get invited to as an observer. So that's been been quite helpful. Um, as we've gone through the process of uh, reviewing the BAF, we've we've had no less than three board sessions, and and I've had um, three separate audit committees where where we've been able to to review uh, progress as well so from the point of view of triangulation um you know how we're we doing things um uh, are, are things being done at appropriate times are our processes and procedures uh, are, are, are that are underpinning uh, our work around risk are all those things happening as they should be and and so we've had a, a great number of opportunities to be able to, to to triangulate those activities and i suppose again for um, for, for newer governors in particular, I, I, I should say that um, the role of, of, of my particular committee, the audit committee, is not to, to look at individual risks, and, you know, whereas um, the, the people, people or, or, or quality or strategy might be looking at, at individual risks. It's, it's not the role of audit to do that. The role of audit is to give assurance to the board that the processes and procedures that underpin the whole system um, uh, are, are appropriate 
um, and and uh, and accurate, um, and so that that's what we've be, been able to do. And it, again, it, it works when you think about a triangulation process. Individual committees are taking on individual risks. Um, my audit committee is taking on um, a, a view of, of 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 the processes and procedures that that, that underpin it. And I suppose I, I, I finish off by saying, um, you know, in part of, 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 of that assurance, um, normally the ability to go out and look at things and meet people and to, 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 to look at parts of the organisation is an essential part of that triangulation. And of course, you know, we're all looking forward to uh, a time when we can get back on and, and, and do that. Uh, I'll stop there, Chair, and take any questions. Jim. Uh, first of all, thank you, Stephen, for the performance assurance report. It's coming through, it seems to me, in a much more accessible way for governors. And I know a huge amount of efforts being made to, to reach that point. And I just wanted to say thank you for that. Um, on the board assurance framework, you make the point at the end that governors can review the board assurance framework. And I'd just like to encourage governors to do that, uh, particularly new governors, to, to see how this organic responsive development work that you've been describing is, is managing risk and moving things forward. My final point really is also relating to how governors might connect as we, as we open up um, the trust again. And looking at the committee memberships, which you've outlined in the, in the report, I suppose it's a question really whether the trust directors might, would welcome or find helpful governors wishing to link with particular committees and, and perhaps in the way in which they um, visit in inverted commas services in the future, they might link with governors connected to the area of interest that the committee represents. Would that work from your point of view? Um, um, well, I think it, 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 it certainly um, would have a possibility to, and I think that there's, there's definitely um, uh, the, the 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 chance of linking up with with individual NEDs who've got specific responsibilities, and I think that's perhaps the uh, the, the the way into it. Um, and um, you know, what, what, uh, again, uh, once we get back to to being able to do visits, even virtual visits. Um, um, the you know the 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 offer comes up to to uh, to go to different places and and it's always clear which ned you'd be going with so so that 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 uh, ability to you know to uh, to buddy up or to look at individual issues with individual neds is definitely there mm. i think steve banks mentioned a, a new subcommittee uh, correct me if i'm wrong steve but um the the people culture and inclusion uh, subcommittee and and I, I have I know from um, c comments that, that governors have made at, at the informal meetings as well as the formal ones there would be particular interest in the way in which the scope of that work is taken forward. Can I, I, I if I could just sort of cut across that I think um, these are really helpful ideas for us to feed into the piece of work that Shirley described earlier about us getting back into yeah. um, uh, the, the way that we do these visits and make them as meaningful as possible. So if I could just ask Shirley to have made a note on that and to, yeah. and to, to pick those up. And um, also just a suggestion that um, we, I, I'm sure we could do a session on the board assurance framework as part of governor development too. Um, Stephen, can I get you just to, to, to wrap up the final piece? I know both the CQC and the vaccine we talked about quite a bit with John's piece. Uh, I'm just watching the clock a little. Okay. Uh, well, at this point, I would have I would have been handing over to to Carolyn White, who 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 chairs quality, and but but I understand she's not here because she's she's out um, helping the vaccination effort somewhere. So uh, um, uh, I'll cover those two areas. We we have heard the detail from John, uh, but again, what I can say is that that these two particular areas. Have have seen a lot of attention from the quality committee. Um, you know, a, a number of papers at different different committees, number of actions that that have been agreed, which I know that Caroline and and the committee members have followed through, and and because these two issues have been. Um, so much uh, at the front of mind. Uh, we've had further assurance in that uh, 
the 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 fortnightly uh, catch ups that, uh, that 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 all of the Neds have with uh, with Paul and John. Um, these two issues have been up front of mind, so we've we've, we've been able to keep a, a, almost having a running commentary on 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 those two particular issues. So happy to take any any questions. So let's just see if there's any any further questions just in relation to that assurance in terms of both the CQC and the vaccination. I think I think we uh, governors did give that a good going through, to be honest, in, in John's yes. report. Yes, I, I thought that's why I left it till last. OK, thanks. Thanks, thanks for Jeff. that, Stephen. And um, and um, in terms of just to say to governors, uh, as Stephen said at the top of that, uh, it's a first of a sort of a revamped way of us trying to bring you evidence of assurance. So if you do have feedback about this, please do feed it back to us, either through Lucy or through Jim or indeed direct to Stephen. Uh, that would be really helpful for us. Um, so um, I'm conscious of the time. I'm going to um, suggest that we take a, a, a five minute comfort break just so that we can all concentrate on the um, the last few items. Um, so if we if we can restart at half past, please, uh, and people can just take a quick comfort break uh, and then then we can be fresh to go on to the next items. Thanks very much. And we'll leave we'll leave it recording still um, so you don't don't leave the meeting and come back. Just uh, just just leave your desk. Thank you.
OK, <clears throat> so I um, hope everybody's suitably refreshed and we can move on to the last part of our uh, agenda, please. Um, so, uh, Lucy, if we could go to item 27, the governor election report, please. Lucy, are you on mute? Sorry. I was just saying I'm Lucy Mills, Governor and Membership Officer for the Trust. Um, just to mention that the election process concluded last month. Um, we've elected um, a number of new governors and also two um, existing governors were re-elected. Re um, and those governors have completed their induction um, last month and um, welcome to your first meeting. Thanks for that, Lucy. Um, I'm not sure there's anything that people will have questions or comments on with that. It's a, it's a piece for information for us, I think. Yeah, it is. The results are in the paper. Great. Thank you. And if we can, and um, Jim's, uh, Jim's just put a comment in there about it being great to see all constituencies um, are covered. Uh, also welcoming the new governors. Uh, so if we could go on similarly to item 28, please, Lucy, on the deputy lead governor election. Yes, so just to put this into context, at the January council meeting, um, the council approved the proposal to seek uh, a deputy lead governor. Um, and that process um, took place over the last couple of weeks. Um, the election was uncontested. So that um, nomination was Benga Shader, who automatically takes up that position of Deputy Lead Governor. So this item is just um, asking the Council to approve that um, appointment of Deputy Lead Governor. Great, thank you. Um, it's all gone through the due process. Um, so if we could just put that to the Council, please. And um, if you could uh, give me an indication with uh, a, a Y or an N, please. Thank you very much. Um, and Benga, really, really pleased that um, you were able to put yourself forward for uh, the role of deputy. Hello. Hi, Benga. <laughs> Do you want do you want to give do you want to give any comment, Benga? Can you hear me? Just yes. You're not Don't coming. Be shy. <laughs> You're not coming through very clearly, Benga, I'm afraid. Um, but we we uh, certainly Hello, I'm having Issues, please. Yeah, I, uh, I think you are having some connection difficulties. Um, just to say, we, we will be linking Benga in um, with um, my deputy, Stephen Jackson, as well, just as another piece of the picture. Um, but let's let's well let's say welcome, Benga. Congratulations on taking on this role. Um, so thank you for that. If we move on then to 29, which is the non-executive director. Um, appraisals. Um, sorry, Paul. sorry, Paul. Jim had his hand up. I don't know. Uh, thank you, uh, Jim. Yeah, I just had my hand up to do what you're doing and say thank you um, to Benga for for taking on the role of deputy lead governor. I've got a sense of relief uh, that you, that you're doing it too. Um, there's a real job to be done. We've heard from the uh, roving reports around the trust at today's meeting how much we need to connect and I'll be very grateful uh, for Benga's assistance in discharging my own responsibilities. Great, thanks Thanks for that, Jim. Okay, so let's move on to the non-exec director um, appraisal report. And um, uh, I'd, uh, I'd flagged in my um, chair's report that one of the things that I'd done since uh, the council last met was to carry out appraisals 
um, of six of the non-executive directors. Um, so uh, as is as is referenced there, um, Manjit Darby and Umar Zaman um, uh, had only joined in October, so um, obviously wasn't an opportunity to do an annual appraisal for them. Um, and it was really an opportunity to do some looking back at their year, but also to be looking at um, some specific pieces for them to pick up on. Uh, and um, for each of the uh, non-exec directors, they've got a, a sense of key areas that they are uh, focusing in on. Some of them relate to the committee membership and roles within those committees. Others relate to um, particular strengths that uh, non-executive directors have got that I was seeking um, to, to, to have brought into the board of directors even more. We reference the evaluate system, which is the same uh, electronic system which governors will, uh, some governors will remember, was used for uh, ah. you bringing comments on me and my appraisal. And part of the rationale for using that is it's an opportunity to build year on year. And um, I just wanted to bring um, the appraisal um, uh, process to the attention of the council uh, and to be noting that the, um, the ratings um, through Evaluate that the non-executive directors got from their colleagues around the board table um, actually uh, stack up very well against the benchmarking data that Evaluate holds uh, for other um, boards and the way they use those. Um, and uh, I think it's uh, obviously it's the first time that I've carried out appraisals with the non-exec directors. Um, and I think that when we do it next year, um, there'll be more for us to have developed and built on um, as we've gone through this year. Um, but it felt important, despite the fact that we were doing this in the context of the pandemic, that there's an opportunity for non-execs to reflect on what had gone well for them during that year and indeed to be thinking about things that they wanted to do even more of in the year ahead. So um, I put that out there uh, and just pause to see if anybody's got any comments or questions in relation to the non-executive director paper, please, on the appraisals. Jim, do you want to come in, Jim? Are you there, Jim? Yeah, sorry, it didn't, it didn't unmute clearly, sorry. I was simply thanking you, Paul, for a clear paper uh, and going on to say that it would be helpful if development areas that come from the appraisals could be made known to the Council of Governors because we could then connect through our own development areas to the trust's overall priorities and for new governors it would also i think help us discharge our responsibility for holding non-executive directors to account great i think that's that's useful feedback that i think um if i could ask shirley just to make a note of that for us for processes as we go forward uh, i think it's also fair to say that um uh, uh, for the non-executives as well actually um, going through it in this way was a new process for them um, so we had some collective learning that fell out of that uh, one of the pieces that um, i subsequently picked up for example is that um, we've agreed that uh, we'll have quarterly one-to-one sessions between non-execs and myself, um, uh, uh, notwithstanding any of the other formal and less formal sessions that we have collectively, which I think is an opportunity for the non-execs and myself just to really keep on reflecting in a little bit more real time uh, about how things are going. Uh, but happy to build that in, um, Steve, uh, uh, Jim, thank you. Okay. Um, I'm not seeing any other comments there. Let's go, if we can, then to item 30, which is a verbal item. Uh, Sarah, if you want to introduce yourself and the item on the annual plan, please. Thanks, Paul, and uh, good evening, everybody. I'm Sarah Furley, and I'm the Exec Director for Partnerships. Um, and I've got um, six slides, actually, I'm just going to talk through um, to give context for the annual plan. And Lucy is going to bring them up um, any minute. So whilst they're coming up, I, I am um, 
Oh, there they are. I can see them. Thank you, Lucy. Um, so if you could uh, just go to the um, first slide. What I'm going to talk through is the national planning guidance, um, um, the um, developing draft um, annual plan for, for us and what our next steps are. So just moving on um, to next slide, please. The planning guidance, it was published um, right at the end. The national planning guidance was published right at the end of March. Um, and what it sets out is that the integrated care system, the ICS. Oh, sorry, Lucy, just go back one. <laughs> the integrated that's it thank you the integrated um, care system has to develop a triangulated plan that has got activity workforce and money in it just for the first six months of the year and the rationale is is as we talked about earlier that because um, societally it's very difficult to understand the size of the covid cost pressure coming um, we've been told that there will be a NHS financial settlement later on this year for months 7 to 12. So in the first instance, we're, we're just planning as a system um, for the first six months. Um, there are six priorities at a national level. Um, and if we move on to the next slide, I'll just talk those through. So the six priorities are um, about supporting the health and well-being of our staff. So the kind of things that we'll be thinking about is having health and well-being conversations, how we make sure that staff are safe, for instance, with infection prevention and control measures, um, and also um, the national planning guidance sets out that every integrated care system needs a mental health hub um, for its staff. Um, and also that national guidance, uh, that national priority, the first one is going to be about um, how we grow our workforce and we get that pipeline right and get additional staff into the NHS. Second priority is all about the um, COVID vaccination programme and how we continue to meet the needs of people that have COVID. So um, that is about people, for instance, who have uh, perhaps suffering from long COVID um, and we've now got clinics there but it's also about um, some of the um, work that we've been doing with COVID patients at home so we've got virtual wards at home uh, that prevent hospital admission. Also under that um, second national priority is um, the NHS is being asked to look at its critical care capacity and this is in preparation in case we um, experience a third wave. Uh, priority C at a national level um, is all about um, accelerating the restoration of services and John mentioned it earlier about um, how surgical elective services um, uh, are, are restored. We have significant waiting lists now um, both for surgery, cancer care and other services and how do we get those um, services back up and running and put in additional capacity to get through that waiting list and that backlog of people. Um, under that um, third priority, um, the national um, guidance does mention um, this is also about putting an increasing um, capacity in for the growing demand on mental health services. So that that national priority is really relevant for us as a trust. Um, priority D is about primary care and how we get um, GP practices and community services back up and running. Um, they've been running predominantly um, telephone services with an increasing number of face to face contacts in more recent months. But how do we get them back up to full capacity as well? Um, and this um, priority is also where we address all of the health inequalities. Priority E is about uh, transforming community and um, urgent and emergency care. It's predominantly about 111 services, A&E services um, and same day emergency services, but it is relevant for us as a trust because it does talk about timely crisis response to avoid um, hospital admissions. And I'll say a bit more about that later. And then the sixth 
um, priority is about working collaboratively across the system and this is very much this year about how we work together to deliver those um, national priorities but also um, as we go through this year um, and we all understand the impact of the white paper I think that sixth priority will become uh, more important. So um, if we could just move on to the next um, slide please. So those are our, are our national um, priorities. So as a trust, um, what we have done is we've asked clinical directorates, the clinical divisions and corporate services to think through what their operational priorities would be. And then as an executive team um, and as a board, we've looked at what our strategic priorities would be. Um, and I'm just about to talk that through now. So this is work in progress. But where we want to get to is that we have one trust, one plan. So whilst the integrated care system are writing a plan just for six months, we're actually going to write a plan for the next 12 months because we do believe we know what we've got to do this year. So next slide, please, Lucy. Thank you. So we have got 49 um, operational priorities that have really come from the services, the directorates, the divisions and, and up. And we've got 11 strategic priorities and it's the strategic priorities that I'm going to talk through now. So the first one is um, about supporting staff well-being. Um, and I think, um, you know, after the year that we've had, it's really important that we that we get this right so that we make sure that staff um, are looked after um, so they can continue to look after patients well. So there's some technical things in there about making sure we've got um, good workforce utilisation, making sure that we're planning correctly for um, increasing workforce recruiting and developing staff. Second strategic priority for us is about um, just and restorative culture. So this is about building on the values and behaviours work that was kicked off in 2019 that we have been using throughout the pandemic. Um, and earlier on, we touched on um, closed cultures. So this piece of work is really um, um, to, to um, start to spread that values and behaviours work and, and move into how do we create, create the type of um, open culture where we can talk freely. The third um, uh, strategic priority is about um, what we've called developing an early warning system. And again, we've already talked about this through this afternoon, this evening's discussion. So for me, this is about what's our soft intelligence? What, um, if people are talking freely, what are we hearing? What's our hard performance? data telling us. So how do we triangulate that as a trust and get into a position where we get this early warning if we've got things that are deviating um, away from where we would like to see them? Fourth priority is about improvement boards. Now, previously um, we've had improvement boards um, that have been um, predominantly driven to meet CQC requirements, but we're going to try and shift away from that and have improvement boards um, where they not only address perhaps where we've got significant issues, but they also drive where we've got really significant transformation. Um, fifth priority is about um, improving health outcomes for people. Um, and reducing um, inequalities. And this really is where we start to make sure that we've got the right capacity. I mentioned mental health growing demand earlier, but this is where we've got the right capacity to meet um, service users' needs. Um, number six is about transforming community um, and urgent care services. And I mentioned earlier the national um, uh, area here. So um, we are um, going to be implementing a crisis response for people at home with a response time of two hours. Um, that's um, great um, uh, um, to meet people's needs, but um, we'll take some planning um, to implement that and that will meet the national requirement. Next slide, please, Lucy. So just to finish um, and describe the, the, the last few of our 11 strategic priorities. Next one is about financial health. 
So um, clearly we want to break even as a trust, but we also need to think about um, system um, uh, breaking even as well and the pressures because the system um, has historically run in a deficit position. But also financial health is about how do we make very robust investment decisions internally um, and how do we do cost improvement programmes, not cost cutting programmes? So all of those things are covered under that priority. And then um, the eighth priority is really about us getting to um, the right systems and processes within our trust so that we can support and enable um, clinical services uh, to do what they do well. So the kinds of things that we're looking at is um, how we get to a distributed leadership perspective. So how we make use of our middle management tiers, how we bring improvement and transformation together and really how we um, look at knowledge management um, and um, analytics. So we get to the point of being able to make really intelligent decisions and they're all processes that we just need to sharpen up within the trust so that's a priority for this year and then finally the last three priorities are all about our contribution to the system so we're looking at how we lead the integrated care system mental health board and drive forward the long-term plan mental health um, uh, priorities how we work collaboratively as a system and ultimately there's a national um, priority about delivering a single care record. Get that right and we'll have the right information and the right intelligence for making some of the future decisions. So those are our 11 priorities and then just onto the final slide please um, uh, Lucy. So next steps. So um, last week at Board Development, we talked about how we're going to align those 49 operational priorities that um, that our services have developed to those 11 strategic priorities that we've just talked about. We're going to um, identify some real um, key success measures. Um, obviously so that we know whether we are delivering what we have set out to deliver or not, but also so that um, when we are working as a trust, we take out duplication and we can aggregate impact at a trust level. Um, board are going to consider the integrated care system plan in May, and then they're going to receive our trust annual plan in June this year. So it's fairly tight turnaround for, for agreeing these plans. Other things that we um, just need to finalise is that we need to be really clear um, for all of our priorities which committees they go to so they um, can uh, receive assurance and then those committees will report into the board. Um, it is an ambitious plan um, and we need to make sure that we've got the right capacity to deliver that ambitious plan and if we haven't decided how we're going to schedule those priorities. We're going to need some really tight um, program management um, support around it and an agreed approach so we make sure that we monitor whether we're delivering or not. And in order that we do deliver, we're going to have to accelerate our distributed leadership so that our um, senior managers, middle managers um, take responsibility for, for delivering some of these plans. And then finally, we need a really um, sharp communication plan so that whatever level you work at within the trust um, we can all between us articulate what our priorities are this year. Um, so Paul I'm going to stop there that was my last slide. Okay. Thanks thanks Sarah and um, I'm, I've, got a, I've got a suggestion to make for um, Governor Collies because I'm, I'm really mindful that that's, that's, that's brought a great deal of both high level with the potential of us going down uh, lots and lots of pieces of detail and we're also nearly two hours into our session and what I'm what I'm suggesting um, uh, is that actually um, if you treat that governors as okay here's here's the heads up the headlines some evidence that this is th the work that's being done but that what we do is schedule it into some board and governor 
um, the joint board and governor session, because I, I don't think we're going to do justice to having a conversation around it um, the, the, this evening. Um, I think it's helpful that you've had sight of it, but I, I would much rather um, that we, we, we build in a really strong opportunity for us to have some of those really good board and governor um, conversations and work it. It means that we can get in some, some depth, which I think is a kind of conversation that's probably not quite right for us to do in the in the public council meeting. I, I'm seeing I'm seeing some um, some some support for that as an approach. Um, including a thumbs up from Jim, which is always welcome. Um, so, uh, Shirley, d did you just want to comment on that yeah. before I move no, just, us on? Yeah, just to say, I'll, I'll make sure that that happens going forward, and we'll be really clear why we're bringing these things to COG. Yeah, because because I, I think the way that we can then have those discussions, I think we can make sure that we can really draw on governor perspectives as we have proper conversations about pieces. So if we're OK to, to take that um, and just um, I, I have got one item of uh, any other business. So just before I get to that, I'll just pause to see if any governors have got any questions on um, other pieces. I'm not seeing anything there. Um, OK, um, in which case, just to go to um, and, and, and any other um, business piece, um, I just wanted to uh, again introduce uh, somebody who should have been flagged right at the start of the meeting. Uh, uh, apologies. Um, I want to introduce uh, Yolanda Martin, who's our Associate Director of Communications, um, just to give us, uh, 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 to, to give governors um, just a couple of bullet points um, about the state of play of our Oscars uh, awards. Uh, Yolanda, do you just want to introduce yourself, say hello, and just uh, give us a couple of bullet points on the Oscars, please. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Paul. I'm Yolanda Martin. I'm Associate Director of Communications. I joined the Trust on the 1st of Feb, so very pleased to be here. Um, I just wanted to give you really an update on the Oscars and how fantastic it has been this year. We've had a total of 433 nominations, um, which is the most that the organisation has ever had in the 18 years that the um, Oscars process has been running. Uh, the team think that's to do with COVID, obviously, but also because we've also taken the opportunity this year to streamline and simplify the process. Um, for me, what's really good news as well is that across the board, um, in the nominations categories. We've had a good cross selection across the whole of the organisation from every single one of our divisions. So that's absolutely brilliant. The shortlisting is going to be announced on, I think, the 13th or 14th of May with a virtual ceremony um, taking place on the 10th of June. So I just want to thank executive colleagues and team leaders for encouraging their teams to um, nominate each other. It really has been a great effort. Thank you, everybody. That's great. Thanks. Thanks, Yolanda. Um, I mean, it is really, really positive to see. Um, and um, I'm really looking forward to uh, getting a sense of some of those great nominations. And um, you're very welcome in the trust as well, Yolanda. Um, OK, colleagues, I'll just double check that I've not missed any more. Uh, yes, Jim, uh, totally agree about um, the, the, the um, both the quantity and I'm sure quality of nominations um, that have come through. Uh, so I look forward to the process that we'll be um, going through to whittle those down. Um, so um, we've got a joint board and council of governors scheduled for the tail end of June. Um, and we've picked up a few items that we we'll want to um, uh, capture there. Uh, and as we'd mentioned earlier, the next Council of Governors itself is in July, um, which again is one of those times it feels like it's a long way away. I bet it'll come around really, really quickly for us. Um, oh, sorry, Paul, can I just point out that it is the 15th of July, not the 25th of July, which is on, is on the agenda. Oh. I was reading from the agenda there. Thank you, Lucy. That was uh, uh, a, a clarification there. Make sure that that goes out. And just to say, uh, I think Jim had asked about getting the slides that Sarah had shared. Uh, I, I'm sure that we can share those round 
um, uh, 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 ahead of us getting into a conversation at the joint board and council of governors session. OK, colleagues, I'm going to if there's nobody else wanting to come in on anything, uh, I'm going to call that uh, meeting of the Council of Governors to a close now. Uh, thanks very much, everybody. And um, I look forward to keeping on getting contacts with governors and um, hopefully in the relatively not too distant future, we'll actually be able to start to plan to be meeting in a room together, which I think would be a significant improvement for us being able to connect with one another uh, and actually uh, really make our conversations work well. Uh, but great to see all of those folk that uh, I've been able to see on the screen. Keep on taking care, everybody. Stay safe. And uh, I look forward to uh, catching up with you at our next opportunity. Thanks very much. Bye, everybody. Thanks, Thank you. Bye.